uh, by show of hands, who already knows what expression templates are? Great. And who has used them for something uh, at work or something for fun or whatever? So a handful. Okay. Uh, yeah, that works too. Like, so who has experience using them as a, a client of a library? Okay. All right. I was just kind of curious because um, I gave this to my local users group and they had no idea what expression templates were. So <laughs> it's a very different audience. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is what expressions templates are uh, and um, introduce Yap. And then we're going to talk about some lessons learned. Now, the lessons learned are when I was implementing Yap, uh, I first started just as a C++ 17 project entirely, and then I realized, well, you know, there's not really that many compilers and availability, so let's make a C++ 14. And there's some interesting uh, things I discovered when I sort of did it in that order that I would I'd like to share with everybody. Uh, okay, so first part, expression templates. So what are these? They are literally C++ expressions, I mean templates rather, that you use to represent expressions, okay? And <clears throat> this allows you to capture an expression and then use it uh, as a tree, and then use it for uh, transformation and evaluation later. So what is the point of this? Why are we doing this? Well, there's two things. Optimization is a big one, and expressiveness is the other one. I would argue that you always get expressiveness, even when you get the optimization, um, because what you're getting is a nice wallpaper over uh, the optimization, where you don't have to see the steps that you actually have to do for the optimization. You just got to get them automatically as a result of some transformations that someone who wrote a library has done. But optimization is often a, a major use case as well. Okay. So first example is, uh, this is from the Eigen documentation. So Eigen is a linear algebra package that uses expression templates heavily to do its, its work. And in their example, they have this vector xf. The x means it can be any size. The f means it's a float. And so we've got four of these. And if we write this, uh, this uh, assignment statement here, where we have uh, you know, this expression on the uh, right, 3b plus 4c times 5d, and we assign that to a, um, the naive way of doing that creates five temporaries, right? You create a temporary for each term, 3b is a temporary, 4c is a temporary, et cetera, and then you, do, you add two of them together, two of those terms together, that creates a new temporary. Then you take that result and add it to whichever one you didn't add in before, and that's your fifth temporary. Uh, you keep rescanning, let's say, the third element of b multiple times, right? In the case of b, if you do it, uh, all the temporaries happen uh, left to right, then you're gonna scan that element of b five times. If In that same scenario, you would scan d, uh, twice, but that's still two times too many, or one time too many. Okay, so you could say to your users, okay, well, when you use this vector f, write it like this, because it's way more efficient. Now you look at everything once, uh, things stay hot in cache, and that sort of thing. And Eigen does that, but what it also does is it generates SIMD instructions under many circumstances for this same kind of operation. And that's something that's much harder to ask your users to do. So this is where we get out of the land of just like, you know, it's. It's, uh, it's nice to have this other nicer form, but we could have asked people to do it, but now we're in the land of something that we can't ask a lot of users to do. A lot of people can't write portable SIMD code. It's very hard to like, you know, they have to end up having to write a lot of stuff themselves or, or use some other uh, extrinsic package to get that done. So, um, auto differentiation, for those of you who don't know what it is, is uh, symbolically representing a function and then uh, generating its derivatives uh, symbolically. So it's not a numeric um, uh, process, it's a symbolic uh, process. And uh, there's lots of libraries out there that do this. I found one, and this is what it looks like uh, when you use it. Okay, so if you look at the top, I know it's kind of small, but you've got this, um, this function here. It's a function of three variables, x1, x2, x3. And the function is, you know, minus one x, uh, I mean, minus five times x1 plus sine of 10, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that relatively straightforward to write in C or C++ kind of uh, function turns into this because the way they're doing the way they're doing the symbolic representation is they've got like a tree of nodes okay so you make a, a node for a plus operation you add the operands in the left and right so it's not important for you to understand all this code the important part is to understand that it's hard to understand all this code right <laughs> so what I want to write is something that looks like that expression up there but what I end up writing is all this garbage okay and this is actually one of the examples from the YAP online documentation uh, so that I've got uh, an implementation that, that doesn't change the way that library works. It still does this node tree. It doesn't do the symbolic representation or symbolic transformation from 
the first function to the, uh, the derivative function, but it just provides a nice wallpaper for generating all those kinds of operations that you just saw on that previous slide, but you get to write it like this. And this looks very much like what you expect from uh, uh, you know, regular uh, C and C++ style code. Uh, there's some oddnesses here, so that one P is for X1 and the two P is for X2 and so forth, but it's more or less directly what we have written in the comment. So if you want to know why, if you're not a user, a regular user of expression templates, why you should care about expression templates, it's that they enforce best practices of your library, whether that be like applying the proper optimizations in the proper places, um, providing an easy to use interface, but then generating a lot more code that's tedious to write but necessary. Whatever that best practice is, it enforces it in the library that you write that uses the expression template so that users don't have to know when to apply those things and remember to apply them in all the right places. Okay, so how do these work? Whoops, went too fast. So expressions are captured as objects, and then we transform them and evaluate, uh, transform and evaluate those objects. So here we've got another placeholder. So this expression, you can think of it as just you know, some variable plus three, and we're capturing that as an expression. And the resulting expression looks like this. Now, I've written my expert because you can use any expression template to capture this, but let's say the expression template we're using was called my expert. This would be, using YAP, what we would get. And if you used another expression template system, you'd get something similar. But the idea here is you've got what kind of expression it is, which is that expert kind plus, and then in the case of YAP, we represent the operands as a Hannah tuple. And so we've got sub-expressions, we've got two of them. So each of the sub-expressions is also an expression with the kind of expression that it is and the sub-expressions. In the case of uh, the first uh, one here, it's a, it's a terminal placeholder and the second one is a terminal int, okay? So by, using, by, by recording all this information and keeping it all uh, in the object, we're able to manipulate it later. Okay, so once we've got that expression, we could do something like transform it. Okay, in the case of yap, this is a yap transform function. And you give it the expression in some transform, and the transform does whatever you need it to do. The, we'll talk about how you write transforms with yap in a bit. And you can also evaluate it. So in this case, if I provide a five for that placeholder, I get five plus three, and that's eight. Okay, so when you create this expression tree, this is done with function overloading, mostly operator overloading. So if we have this my expert expression template, forget about all the stuff except for the operator plus for now. We'll address all that other stuff later. The operator plus is a template that takes something on the right, okay, you're, you're adding something from the right, and then what it returns is a new my expert instantiation whose kind is plus, it's a, it's a plus operation, and then it's got some Hannah tuple with stuff in it. Don't worry about what the stuff is yet. And then the body of it is it somehow makes all that stuff. And the point of leaving that out is that Hannah, I mean, sorry, that Yap using Hannah in part does all that for you, okay? There's Hannah transforms and stuff like that. It's very nice to build this on top of Hannah. And Yap takes care of all this boilerplate because all these functions when you write them look nearly identical to each other. Um, and it's, it's very tedious to write all that stuff. Okay, so since that operator plus returns a new expression template instantiation, a new my expert uh, instance, um, we have that operator plus on it as well, and you can chain them. Okay, so as long as you have one terminal at the beginning uh, that is sort of poisons this whole syntax tree as being a, a YAP syntax tree, uh, now all of these are going to turn into YAP terminals after the first one. Okay, I guess I said that. Okay, so the state of the art for expression templates. Well, option one is you write your expression template system where you write stuff like that operator plus and your, your expression uh, template types. You don't use a library, you do it all yourself. And this is what almost everybody does in practice. Uh, Eigen does this, uh, Boost Ublast does it, there's lots of other examples, right? Uh, option two is to use Boost Proto. And Boost Proto is a library for doing this, it already exists in Boost. And Boost Proto is um, difficult to use because it is written to the 98 standard. And there's sort of no option but to do certain things that it does that makes it hard to use. And um, this is used in Boost mostly. Uh, there are other people using it outside of Boost. Um, and people are doing really interesting things with it. But it remains very difficult to use. That was why, that was what motivated, uh, yeah. But option three is what you, happens almost all the time. People just don't do it. 
right? There have been somewhere around half a dozen times in my career I've been like, you know, expression templates would be the perfect way to solve this problem, and we're not going to do that <laughs> because it takes a long time to write an expression template system. And essentially, we would rather uh, just require people in this case to know what the right thing is to do because enforcing that they do the right thing with an expression template system is just too much syntactic weight. This is what almost always happens. Okay, so Yap itself. Uh, so <clears throat> design goals of Yap, like I said, uh, you know, I wanted to make stuff easy to do because I feel like um, expression templates and type erasure and there's a number of, of things like this in C++ that make C++ what it is. All these exciting things you can do with C++, but they're largely underused because it's very hard to use them. They're, they're usually a domain of experts. So this was designed to get this out of that domain. And in service of number one, uh, I wanted to make all the expressions that you see when you use Yap have the same mental model as a regular C++ expression that does not use Yap. Uh, and also, uh, because I was sort of comparing it to uh, Proto, um, I wanted to remove all the implicitness if you don't want to use it. You can do lots of stuff implicitly in the library, um, and we'll get to more detail about what, what I mean by that, but you can do everything explicitly uh, when you want to, and I think that makes for better code. And then uh, we want to be able to do everything that Proto can do and hopefully more stuff, but writing less user code. Okay, so the app is structured like this. We have the expression concept, and to get into the expression concept, I first have to talk about this expert kind enumerator. So this is a closed set of all the expressions you can have in the app, or all the kinds of expressions you can have in the app. Uh, there's an expert ref, which is just a reference to another expression. We'll get into why we need that later. Uh, there's terminals, which are leaf nodes in your tree. Uh, that would be like the literal int we saw or the placeholder that we saw. Um, overloadable operators like plus, minus, equals, etc. There's an analog to the ternary operator because uh, obviously you can't overload the ternary operator, but it's very useful to have something that does that same kind of operation. And it's, uh, it's non-trivial to write for a user, so it's an important part of the library. And then there's the call operator. So any one of your expression templates can have the call operator on it, and uh, uh, you can call that, that object. So um, these all have a fixed arity except for the call operator, um, and it's usually a pretty small arity. Now, uh, this is a uh, less formal version of what's in the online documentation, but it's slightly more formal than what we just saw. The idea is for anything to be uh, a YAP expression, the expression needs a static constant X per kind. That's what kind of expression it is. And it needs a data member, which is a HANA tuple that has the elements that go with that, um, that kind of operation. Okay, so... Um, like I said, more formally in online documentation, it says like what expert kinds go with what kind of tuples and so forth. But the idea is if you have a binary plus, you need two operands and things like that have to match. So most of the yeah, functions are templates that operate on expressions. And um, so that's important to remember because they only um, pay attention to the expression uh, concept. Um, and that means that you can mix different um, uh, instantiations of different expression templates that you've created uh, in the same expression. Uh, it's not going to deduce the kind of the expression template and then they all have to match that. It's very mix and match. Everything is done in terms of the concept, not any particular type or, or a template, template parameter. Okay, so the expression template concept, you can see why I did this this way, is anything that when you give it exactly two temp template parameters, one a, uh, an expert kind, a uh, non-type template parameter and one um, a hand tuple, it produces an expression, okay? And I just did these formally up front because you're gonna see me use these expressions over and over again. I want people to have a basis for them, but um, I think you kind of get what's going on here. And uh, most, uh, well, every app function that, that produces an expression needs to know what expression template to use to do that because, again, everything is done in terms of the expression template concept or the expression concept. And so if it has an expert kind and a uh, tuple that it's going to use to create an expression, it needs to know what template to use to, to create that expression. Okay, so specific features. We've got the algorithms that operate on expressions. The first one is evaluate. It does pretty much what you think it does. Um, evaluate will take your expression and then optionally um, a variadic list of things to fill into placeholders, and then we'll eva evaluate that expression. Uh, and you can have extra uh, values on the end of there that uh, are in excess of the number of placeholders that are needed and they're just ignored. Uh, and if somewhere in there you have, let's say, operator plus getting evaluated, 
there's a customization point called eval plus that you can provide that then changes what that operator plus does. You can even provide uh, these customization points to implement operators that don't exist on the types that, that you're using in your expression. Okay, and evaluate as is somewhat similar. It has this extra R template parameter, that's the return type, and um, that gets passed to this particular customization point that just applies to this function. And the purpose of this customization point is that because uh, eval expression as can be specialized for different um, types R, you can have it do different things. So um, by default, what eval expression as does is it just calls it evaluate and then it just static casts the result to R. That's not very interesting. But the interesting case is when you want to do different things for different types R. Okay, so let's say I have a mathematical expression and I want to evaluate it as a bunch of double math in one case and I want to do it as single precision uh, SIMD instructions in another case. I can have my SIMD type that I'm using to do all this work and I can provide that for R in one case and I can provide double in another case and then if I have the appropriate customization points defined for those two uh, types for val expression as, then I get that different behavior in those two different places. Okay, transform. Uh, transform is the workhorse of the whole library. It does everything you want to do, including eval and eval as, uh, or evaluate and evaluate as. Um, so it takes an expression, and it takes some transform that's going to be applied to the expression, and uh, it returns a new thing. I, I almost said expression, but it doesn't have to return an expression. Um, that bears repeating. It can evaluate the expression, or it can transform it into a new expression, because what happens is entirely governed by what you put in the transform. You can put whatever you want in there, okay? Um, and uh, so the way the transform works is, uh, so the tree is visited top down, and whenever it finds a match, and a match is found whenever it tries to call for that node in the tree, it tries to call, use transform as a callable for that, that node. If that is a well-formed expression, then it calls it, and then it produces that result as the, the result of that step. It continues to traverse the rest of the tree and find other matches and do this elsewhere. So what you get is a copy of your original tree and everywhere that that transform matched one of the nodes, you get that node replaced with the result of calling the transform. Now, um, it's important to note that it doesn't recurse down below the node that matches. So if I've got a tree and I've got something at the top, it's an operator plus expression, and I've got uh, a huge uh, tree underneath that with thousands of nodes. If it finds it's supposed to do something with operator plus up here to the left and right, it's just going to do that, and you're going to get a result with one node in it. Right? The node might have those subtrees in it, or it might not, depending on what the transform does. Uh, but you can write the transform in such a way that it does the left and right recursively first, and then you get a recursive transform. That, that control is left to you, and that's important because if you try to traverse the entire tree and apply it everywhere and you do that recursively, you end up in cases where, wait, I don't want to recurse and I can't stop. But this allows you to have control over when the recursion happens and where, and you might want to do it in some cases, not in others. Okay, so <clears throat> we've also got a bunch of functions for accessing that tuple inside of an expression. So for instance, you might call left or right on expression to get the left or right operands. You might call callable or argument uh, arguments sub i on uh, a callable expression to get the callable or the ith uh, argument to that callable expression, or that call expression. And, uh, and you know, these things are, are, are giving you nice static asserts when you're using them inappropriately. So if I have this expression x plus one and I say left of that, I get x and that's fine. And if I say give me the callable in that expression, it says wait, that's not a call expression, you get a static assert. So it's, it's a way of writing your code in a more literate way where you know what you're supposed to have here and you want to make sure you didn't just sort of uh, pass the wrong thing in there. And um, so I do have this one expression template built into the library, and it's the only one, and it's just for reference. So it's got all of the operator overloads defined for it. It's also got if else, and it's got another feature we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but the idea here is that this is great for quick and dirty stuff. You're gonna see me using some examples here. If you just wanna use expression templates in some sort of implementation detail somewhere squirreled away and you don't have that many uh, uh, you know, that many uses of the actual expression template system that you're going to do and you don't care about the fact that it provides too many operators and that can essentially generate expressions that don't make any sense, it's fine for that kind of stuff. But usually, because you might make those expressions that don't make any sense, you want to make an expression template that only has the operators defined for it that, that you care about. Okay, so, and in order to do that, we've got these macros. 
So in this case, uh, this is from the lazy vector example in the documentation. And uh, so this is an expression template. It's got the requirements of the expression template concept there. And then um, it's got these two operator, uh, binary operator members. So one does operator plus, the other does operator minus. And again, we have to provide what kind of uh, expression template to use to make the expression that results. Okay, so when we do operator plus uh, on an object which is instantiation of lazy vector expr uh, with something on the um, something on the right, we need to make a new expression, and we're indicating here by providing lazy vector expr that that's the expression template to use. We could have provided something else, and that's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, a little bit about these customization points. So um, let's say we've got this namespace user, and inside user I have this number type, and it's got just a double value. I can provide this eval plus operation, uh, which is overriding the customization point of the same name, and what it actually does is a minus, okay? Now, notice I did not define operator plus or operator minus as a member or as a free function in relation to, to the struct number anywhere. And yet, when I use this down here, in an expression with two uh, numbers of value one, I get uh, a zero when I evaluate that operator plus between them. Because Yap knows how to evaluate that because the, um, ex the uh, customization point is, is in play, okay? Um, so this is a really uh, useful feature in some cases, but um, essentially this is the implicit way of doing things. This is the way that Proto did it. and. Um, you'll see later that there's, there's better ways to do this that are more explicit and the person writing the code, um, or sorry, rather the person using the library that results from, from writing this kind of code can, can inspect where the transformations are and what transformations are happening if you don't do it this way. Um, oh, and, and by the way, there's customization points that actually do transform. So you can do everything implicitly if you want to in this system. I'm not spending a lot of time on it though because I, I feel it's the, the less useful way to do it. Okay, so a couple of use cases. These are real simple examples, uh, basically taken from the proto examples. I, I've got uh, uh, all the first YAP examples and online documentation are the proto examples, um, and then there's, there's uh, some other ones after that. But so this is really simple. So you've got a, a terminal we're making out of stdc out, and then we do the normal stream operations with hello world, uh, and when we evaluate that, it prints out hello world. Now, I did this in literally one line of YAP code. Like the rest of it is boilerplate hello world stuff you have to have. Well, I guess two if you, if you count including YAP. Um, but the important bit here is that if you use proto, there's a page and a half of code that has to precede this to make this work. And this one is the same sort of story. Um, there's a lot of code that has to come before this, uh, but this is all you have to do if you, if you use YAP. Uh, and in this case, we've just got some very simple expressions and we're just calling evaluate on them in line. And uh, these have placeholders in them so you can provide values for the placeholders. Uh, this does just what you think it does. It's, it's very straightforward. Now, uh, you can kind of ignore these two bottom blocks. I wanted to leave them on the slide because I find that just having one example of something when you could have three uh, already done is, uh, uh, you know, is a pessimization on understanding. So just pay attention to the top one. So this is just the expression that we saw here for the first one, the one that ends up displaying five. And be because we can pass an arbitrary number of extra arguments on the end of these uh, evaluate calls that uh, just get ignored, it's very likely that you've got a user that has written extra arguments that are being ignored, thinking that they shouldn't have been ignored, they should have been used, so maybe you want to make that an error. So this is how you might do that. So you take that first expression with just a placeholder plus two, and now we're gonna make a lambda that captures that expression and then takes an arbitrary number of args. And then we're gonna do something that I'll explain in the next slide to turn that expression into a number, which is the arity of that expression. And then we do a static assert that the arity is the number of arguments that we were passed to this uh, generic lambda, okay? So notice that we're calling transform and we're using the result at compile time. So wherever it works out, you end up doing const expert evaluation of these expressions, right? In this case, it works out because we're doing everything uh, with, um, you know, arities, and we've got that, that information statically. And then if you get past the static assert, then you just do the, the evaluate call uh, exactly as it would have been on the previous slide, but now you've, you know, interposed the static assert instead, okay? 
OK, so here's how we get arity work. So <clears throat> it's best to work from bottom up. Um, so the bottom one is the recursive case. And broadly, what this recursive case is doing is it's taking all of the elements in the current expression, it's transforming each one into an arity, and then it's taking the maximum of those, and that's the arity of the whole expression. OK? Now, if you notice, um, we're taking the expression as an object, right? as a whole object. And you, if you look up these other two transforms, they're doing this tag thing. So what happens in the expression um, form of, of a transform is you just take the whole expression and you can have it be a template parameter and you don't have to worry about the exact shape of it or you can spell out it has to be exactly like my expert of this kind with these, with this Hannah tuple with these things in it. You can get as explicit or, or uh, generic as you want to there. But the other case, uh, the other form I should say of transform is uh, something I took straight out of Proto. It's a great way to do things where you essentially take the you, you, you get a tag as the first parameter, and that's just for you know, overload selection. And that is the kind of, uh, or it's, it's one one with the kind of the expression that was used to make this call. And then you've got the unwrapped uh, arguments uh, that were, or uh, yeah, the unwrapped arguments of that expression. So instead of having like a, um, a uh, my expert of kind terminal that has a placeholder in it inside of a HANA tuple, you just get placeholder. Okay, and instead of getting the T wrapped inside of a, an expression, uh, which in turn is wrapping it inside of a, a HANA tuple, you just get the T. Okay, so these two forms are useful in different cases. As you can see, they're, it's, it's nice to mix and match them. Uh, okay, so the basis cases, though, are these uh, top two. For, so the, the, the uh, middle one here is the one that actually matches just anything that doesn't match the placeholder one above. And so for anything that's not a placeholder, we return a zero. Uh, because nothing, uh, I mean, only a placeholder implies an arity. Uh, any constants or, or any other things uh, are not going to have uh, any effect in the arity. And then the top one just uh, just matches any placeholder uh, of index i. And whenever you see a placeholder of index i, that index is uh, the arity of that placeholder. So we're going to use the top two to, um, you know, uh, do the recursive case uh, below, and we end up getting again. Uh, a transform which gives us a bunch of arities. We take the max of that, we get the whole arity. Okay. And again, I didn't have to write a lot of code to do this, right? It took a little bit to explain it. After you've done this a couple of times, this is this just rolls off your fingers. Sorry, yeah. Why do you want the maximum? Because the arity. Uh, the, the question was, why do I want the maximum? So the, this because uh, so if I've got an expression with <clears throat> a placeholder three in it, I have to pass in three arguments. If I add a placeholder two, I don't have to add any more arguments. I still needed three, and the second one now gets used to fill in the placeholder two. We're looking for the, like, the biggest placeholder in all the trees, and that's the maximum. Exactly. The biggest placeholder in the whole tree is the maximum. Right. Exactly. Yeah. OK, so why did I? Yeah, OK, great, great. OK, so this is using, uh, this is actually uh, evaluating the, the stuff we wrote uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, and uh, this one here is, um, uh, was already going to be the case that we would have had an error without the arity check because we didn't pass enough arguments. But this one would not have been the case without, it would not have been an error without the arity check. <clears throat> okay. So to point this out again, get arity did not produce an expression and it doesn't have to. It produced a value. Okay. And in general, it is the case that transforms can produce expressions, they can produce uh, values, they can produce a mix of the two, they can have arbitrary side effects, they can be stateful. All these things are fine to do because, like I said, transform is designed to let you do whatever you need to do. Yeah? You're a bit cheating because you don't return a value, but a type you're presenting a value. Uh, no, we actually return a value. Actually? Yep. <clears throat> Whoop. Arity is a is a constant. It's a yeah. It's the Hana constant. I could have returned an integral constant there yeah. too, though, right? But same thing. I mean, we're returning a value. But integral constant is also a type. Integral constant <laughs> is the would be the type of the value, but it's still a value. But the point is that in this case, I'm returning a value that we happen to be able to use at compile time to do a static assert. Yeah. But if I could have returned the result of going and looking up. Uh, a, a price on a stock market or something. I mean, it can be a real runtime thing. It could be a, a thing that, that is a, a runtime uh, value that also happens to have information in the type system we can still use. But the point is it can return values. Yep, okay. 
OK, did I skip something? No. All right, so that Eigen example from before, there's an example in the Yap online documentation again that is very similar to that. So this is that example. So we've got these three lazy vectors, and each one is, is uh, going to hold uh, a vector of double with four, four doubles in it. And then we've got the statement here uh, that we want to evaluate the expression v2 plus v3 and take an index into the, the two element of that and assign whatever that is to double, uh, this, this double d1, okay? We've got another statement that says we want to uh, do v2 minus v3 and then do plus equals on that to v1. Now, again, the naive way to do this would be to make a temporary that is the result of doing v2 plus v3 and then index into that. We've done a bunch of extra work. We've allocated memory. We don't want to do that. And the same thing is true of the, the, other, the other statement and expression, which is we're, we don't want to make a temporary for v2 minus v3, and then we don't want to element-wise scan through all those values again to do the plus equals onto v1, right? Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so that, that stuff it works in the example, and I did want to point this out, and I almost skipped it, um, that we don't want this plus equals here to work. We don't want v2 plus v3, which is not an object but an expression. It's not, it's not a, a terminal object, it's an expression. And we don't want to do plus equals of v1 onto that. That kind of doesn't make any sense. We don't know where the, the value should go. Do they go into v2 or v3? We don't want that kind of expression. So we're going to see how we can limit that. Okay, so here's how you would write the lazy vector expr expression template. You've got operator plus and operator minus. You saw those earlier. And this implementation down at the bottom was left out of the, the time you saw this on an earlier slide. But essentially, you just transform, um, you, you transform this expression with a transform that takes the nth value out of it, and that's what the index operator does. So the index operator is greedy. It's not lazy like the, the expression returning operations, okay? Now here's how that take nth um, transform works. It's just got one uh, overload that matches only this yap terminal with um, this you know, vector of doubles in it, okay? And uh, so what it's actually doing in its body is uh, value uh, called on expr uh, gets the, um, for uh, a unary um, expression, it just gets the, the value out of the HANA uh, tuple. So in this case, that's going to give us the vector that's stored, and then we just take the nth out value out of that, and that's our double x. And then we call make terminal with that x to make a new terminal with that x in it. So we've taken this vector uh, terminal, and we've turned it into a scalar terminal. Okay, and the move part is important, but we'll get to that later. So, nothing to see here. Okay, so lazy vector um, is a, a, a special case we want to have for those particular terminals. Okay, um, we could have specialized the lazy vector expr um, expression template for uh, the terminal. Uh, expert kind, but it's just more code to write. This works just just as well. And because everything is done again on exp uh, on the uh, the concepts and not on the particular types or templates used, this works either way. If you do in a, a, a uh, if you do a specialization a, a template specialization, or if you do this this way, okay. And so the constructor is not very interesting. Everything that's interesting here is the plus equals operation. Now, this is why I pointed out plus equals not working on an arbitrary expression before. We want plus equals to work from uh, one uh, expression to, or sorry, one uh, terminal to another, or from an expression to a terminal, but we don't want it to work from a terminal doing plus equals onto some expression. Because again, we don't know which subparts of the expression is supposed to get those values mutated. Uh, and so here we see like, <coughs> uh, which is the, I'm getting myself lost here. Where's this vec? Ah, great, so we used value again, same thing. So we get the, the actual uh, vector out. And so we take the ith element of that vector and then we say we're gonna uh, plus equals the ith value of the right-hand side. Now the right-hand side is an expression, right? So that's where that, um, that eager index operation kicks in. That eager index operation is going to evaluate that expression as a scalar expression, not as, a, as a, um, not as an expression full of uh, vectors, and then that result is what you use in this expression here. Question. Yeah. Um, wouldn't that operator 
plus equals also be callable on temporaries then? Um, what, what do you mean? Uh, I don't understand. It's a member function of lazy vectors. So if I can create a temporary of lazy vector, that, that is not an L value. The lazy vector yeah. plus equals something. Yes, the question was, doesn't this operator plus equals apply to temporaries? Um, and the answer is yes. And um, I, I, I mean, that would be true if you wrote just a non expression template system type with a plus equals on it. That's ampersand. Ampersand? The ampersand on the right hand side uh, after the, the Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah right. right. We, yeah, we could guard it with a ref qual. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so what about code generation? Okay, so this is the assembly for, uh, and here V2 and V3 are just uh, the, um, the stood vectors of doubles. This is the assembly that this generates if I put it in a very small function and just disassemble that function. So that's why we've got a return in there. And here's what we get from the YAP expression, which does all that crap we just saw. Same thing. So um, it turns out that the same is true for this. Like expanding this out into a, 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 a bunch of, like, into a single loop essentially that does uh, all these operations at each step produces the same code with or without YAP, uh, rewriting it for you. Uh, but it was just too much code to present here. Okay, and um, I've got some some stuff like there's a if you if you get Yap off of GitHub and do uh, you you make you you build it and you do make perf, it'll print out a bunch of stuff, including um, a bunch of disassembly of a bunch of different functions. You'll see like when you add uh, more than a certain number of terminals and operations, it stops doing this nice stuff for you. I found uh, on uh, Clang for something, Clang 4 uh, on x86, it was somewhere around 35-ish terminals where it stopped doing exactly the same thing as I would have gotten if I had written it by hand. Uh, and it started inserting some, some function calls I didn't want it to. So it's not perfect, but it gets you a lot of the way there. And if you know that that's an effect, you can uh, chunk up your evaluations into smaller pieces in many cases. Okay, so <clears throat> in this example, we had a terminal that had a vector of doubles in it, okay? It owned that, that was a member. Um, and uh, we didn't need to do that. We could have had references to vector of, of doubles uh, or reference to whatever other uh, kind of terminal uh, type we wanted. And, uh, and that lets you do some nice things, uh, and we'll see about that in a bit. Okay, the other thing from before, from before is the auto differentiation example. So that very ver verbose form, uh, this is the actual function you kind of saw a snippet of before uh, that, that uses, um, uh, that, that replaces all the code we saw before using the, the sort of YAP stuff I wrote to replace that functionality. Uh, and here's how we do that. So <clears throat> we have this new expression template. It has operations for the arithmetic operations. And then we've also got um, these free binary operators for the arithmetic operations. And the reason we need that is because since the members are members, they only match an expression on the left, right? So if you want to match an expression on the right and a non-expression on the left, you're out of luck. This will match an expression on the left and right. And it'll match anything on the, on the right, in fact. But you can't have anything on the left and then expression on the right because there's no member for that without the free ones. Okay, so that's all that does. And, and these macros are defined in such a way that they, uh, they do complementary overload sets where there's no ambiguities, so they don't collide in any way. And then because we want placeholders to not be uh, a YAP expression placeholder or some other expression template, we have this uh, macro that says, uh, I want to define the placeholder operator and I want it to produce um, uh, expressions from the auto diff expert expression template. Okay, and then uh, <clears throat> this is a function expression. It's kind of like what we did with the, um, with the lazy vector before. It's a special case for functions uh, and it has this, um, non-tape template parameter opcode because that library uh, represents functions with an opcode for each function. It's actually, they only support unary functions and each, each unary function has a particular opcode that specifies which function it is. And so this is our way of representing that. Uh, we have a call operator on it um, that we use the macro, the, the YAP supplied macro for that. And then we, pro that we, uh, we define these three sine, cosine, and square root um, so we can use them later. So here's the beginning of the transform. This is not terribly interesting. The idea is we take a placeholder and we make a, um, 
we, we find a place to store that placeholder so we use it as a variable and we create a variable node. So there's this list which is sort of an auxiliary data structures from the original library and then we create the actual variable node there as well. Uh, and then when we see a YAP terminal, so uh, again, I, maybe I went too fast, but this is the, the, the transform that takes that expression and turns it into all that code we saw before. So that was the first case of the, exp uh, the uh, transform. Uh, this is the next case, which is where we take uh, an arbitrary terminal and we create um, a, uh, uh, a pram node out of it. Uh, prams are used to store, uh, I think, uh, constants instead of variables. And then uh, the only reason we need this, uh, this case for the opcode is because the opcode being a non-class enum promotes to a double and you get a problem there. Okay, so then uh, if we see uh, a call expression, we produce a node for a call. If we see a negate expression, we produce a node for a negate. And then we have this mapping from uh, the different uh, YAP arithmetic operation tags to the different opcodes so that we can write one template here that just takes uh, whichever tag that is and gets the op for that tag. And then this is the kind of thing I was talking about before where you can take the um, left and right sides of, of the, uh, 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 the binary expression that we're matching here and you transform them individually, which means you have now a, a pointer to a node. It's a, representing a node tree. And then you uh, use the op for that and make a new node out of it. Uh, and that's the result of this uh, function. Okay. Um, this is how we pull it all together. So <clears throat> the first step is we do the transform. The transform as a side effect, because of that first case of the transform, fills in this list, auxiliary data structures is a requirement of that library, and then it returns like this big node tree, okay? So once we've got that node tree, then we need to go in and fill in some values in the node tree, um, and that's what this uh, for each, HANA for each does here. Um, and it's more complicated than, than it maybe. Um, it seems more complicated than it is, is what I'm trying to say. But this is pretty straightforward, right? You just do the transform, and then once you've got the node tree, some of the nodes need some values, and you stuff them in there, and that's it. And this all just works. Okay, so now, some technicalities of using uh, YAP. So, like I said before, I made every effort to make YAP expressions look like vanilla C++ expressions, and not to break that mental model. So that means that types are partially decayed, and that means you do array to pointer decay, you do array reference to pointer, you do function to function pointer decay. Um, if you are used to using proto, what it would actually do is take um, uh, an array of size n, and that would be the type of the terminal. It would be, the terminal would have in it an array of size n. Yeah, it doesn't do that. It's gonna be a pointer. And the reason is, it breaks your mental model of what it means to pass uh, an array into an expression not to do that. Uh, also, in keeping with the same, uh, you know, attempt to make the, the middle model consistent, L values are captured in expressions by reference. Okay, they're not copied in. R values are treated as temporaries, and they are moved into the expression, and they, they, there's a, a value of that type in the expression, and that's where that value lives. So this is why you had to move that down. That's right, that's right. So, for people who didn't hear it, that's why I had to move that double X before because I didn't want to have a reference to that X on the stack that was going to be dangling. I needed to copy that X, so I move it, and in case of X, it's copy only, and it gets copied instead of moved. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> and so R values obviously share the lifetime of their expression, which is broadly what you expect from a C++ expression, right? You expect that temporary not to outlive the expression that it's in, but now that we can sort of keep a temporary for later, we have to like make an object and move it into the object and have storage there that represents that. And so, as you pointed out, that means that when you call, let's say, make terminal and you want a value of that, that uh, type to be in there and not a reference to that, an object of that type, you need to call um, uh, make terminal with a moved object. Okay, an example. If I write expert equals a plus one, your expectation is that a, the type of a is decal type a, right? It, it, or sorry, it's a reference to decal type A, right? And it doesn't matter whether this is a YAP expression or a C++ built-in expression, you should have that same exp expectation either way. You should also have the same expectation that one is just a value. It's an R value, you don't wanna have a reference to a one, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so again, we keep that mental model consistent. 
So this makes it easy to choose what kind of behavior you want with respect to copies, mutable refs, constant refs, that kind of stuff. And it's just a normal rule. So if I have uh, an int i that I initialized to zero and I have this yap expression where I turn this i into a terminal and I did not move it, right? I just called uh, make terminal of i. The whole expression is i equals 42. So when I evaluate that expression, it, uh, it obviously assigns 42 into the i. Since the i was a reference, when I print out i, it's, um, it prints out 42. If I had said terminal move i and then evaluated it, it would have printed out zero, right? Because it would have been assigning it to a temporary inside the expression. Okay, there is a wrinkle. This is why we have this expr ref thing. Because yap expressions can be built up piecemeal, I can have this sub expr that I define, which is a yap expression, and then I can say expr equals something in terms of sub expr. Now I've created a new yap expression. And C++ expressions cannot do that, right? I mean, if you do sub expr equals one plus two, it doesn't have to retain that whole information that there's a one plus two. And in fact, GCC folds that and you just get a three. That's what lives in AST. Um, and you know, x per equals one divided by zero also would be folded in the same manner by, by GCC. If I'm not mistaken, that would just be a zero in the, in the AST, okay? So you don't keep the one divided by sub expression one plus two in C++, but you do get to keep that in some cases in, in YAP. So that makes that, that wrinkle. So this is why uh, we have that XBREF kind of reference. So the alternative to using XBREF would be that I would take that sub XBR and I would copy it into XBR. Now remember, some of your terminals might own the storage, some of them might refer to the storage. The ones that own it, I'm needlessly copying, maybe doing tons of heap allocation, doing other stuff, launching a missile, whatever, okay? We don't wanna do that. So um, even though it makes my job harder in writing YAP, uh, you actually don't deal with expert refs as a user of the library. You, you, they're, they're largely transparent. You don't really see them. So, uh, but this, this results in a similar thing to what we did with terminals, right? So L and R valueness of sub-expressions, they're treated just like the L and R valueness of terminals. So um, I capture a sub-expression by reference. Sub-expression capture is done with the expert ref thing that I just mentioned. And then R values are moved into the expression. So if I did want to copy that whole thing in, I could just say um, uh, one divided by uh, move sub expert, right? I think that was the expression we were doing. Okay, evaluate versus transform. So evaluate, uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I have had questions for people online about what, to, you know, to compare and contrast these, it seems to be important to people. Like that, there seems to be confusion with, with users. So, <clears throat> Evaluate, because it evaluates the whole tree, has to go and visit every node in the tree. It also picks up customization points uh, via ADL or via the built-in stuff that you've got, right? The, the customization points are used, um, uh, that's the part that happens via ADL, but everything else happens uh, however it did with your built-in types or your, your native types. And this is implicit and predetermined at the, at the point of call. So at the semicolon, after the, you know, evaluate, semicolon, at that semicolon, it is defined what happens, okay? Um, there's no chance for me to, 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 to do anything optional or branchy after that, decide what to do uh, post facto. Now transform can visit none of the tree, or it can visit part of the tree, all the tree, right? Any combination of those. Um, and so the result can be the original tree or something different or what have you, right? It can, be, it can return a value, it can, it can evaluate an expression. Uh, and this is done with an explicit uh, workflow instead of implicit, where I say, you know, auto expert equals something, and then I can do transform, 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 and I can say, maybe I want to do this transform, maybe I don't, maybe I want to choose between these two transforms, maybe I want to parameterize a transform differently. So it's much more flexible and much more literate, and you can see what you get uh, much more easily using transform. Okay, so a bit more about this recursiveness with transform. So <clears throat> if we've got this expression, a plus b times c, if I were to write this transform that matches the plus tag on the top, uh, if I define shallow here, I'm gonna get some function of left and right, okay? And it's not gonna bother to do anything with c in particular. It's gonna do this sub-expression b times c as the operand on the right, and 
it's not going to recursively do anything to it. If I don't define shallow, I get this other implementation where I transform the left and I transform the right, and then the result of that, I do some function of that, and that's what I return. Uh, so I wanted to just really underscore this because this is, um, this is an important point of control when you do transforms. And um, without this, it's very difficult to do them without getting yourself into real trouble. And uh, like I said, this is something that's also been like confusion about that I've, that I've got feedback from people about. Okay, so <clears throat> as we've already talked about, we can have values or references uh, stored in terminals. And using reference terminals can let you do some interesting things where you can essentially de define um, a, a, a bunch of rules and transforms and stuff that work in YAP, uh, that, that use YAP rather, that work on types that never have seen YAP, and YAP doesn't appear anywhere in the client code. So let's take a look at this. So first we define uh, a type trait. So this type trait just rec uh, recognizes uh, std vectors. And then I can, ex uh, I can define a couple of these uh, free functions, free operator overloads, that um, hook into anything that meets that, that type tree. This is another idea I got from Proto. Um, so the idea here is that if either operand is a, um, uh, is a vector, then we wrap it as a terminal, and then we, we treat the, the resulting expression as a YAP expression. And so it won't match just any arbitrary crap and, and give you tons of, of compilation errors or ambiguities or something. It, it only matches things that, that are constrained by the, the, uh, the type trait. So if I define this assign function that uh, assigns to a vector from an arbitrary expression, then um, <clears throat> as long as I know that these things are the same size, in other words, I have the same number of elements in uh, this E over here that I do in the vector I'm trying to assign to, and this is left out for brevity, but this is very similar to the, the get arity kind of thing. You, you just do a transform that gives you the size of, of, uh, of the expression. Um, then for each element, I just element-wise evaluate the ith element of the expression and assign it into that uh, element of vec. Okay. So um, I can define a plus equals in a very similar way to the way this assign is defined, and I left that also out for brevity, but it's you know basically the same thing, same moving parts. And so here's some code. Uh, we've got these uh, five vectors. Four of them are vectors of ints, one's a vector of double, we give them some values. And then after this, in the rest of main, there are no allocations. So if I assign uh, the expression two to B, it tries to transform that two because nothing in the transform matches the two, it's just a forward through. So that means every element sub I of the expression two is just two. And that works because I said as expert here. So even though I didn't pass uh, a YAP expression in there, I'm treating it as if, it, as if it's an expression. Uh, as expert does nothing to actual expressions, and it makes an expression out of something that's not. So basically, you know, wraps it in a terminal. So the first call assigns two to every element of B. The second one, element-wise, the second assign D comma A plus B, that assigns element-wise to every element of D um, well, for, for every D sub I, it assigns uh, A sub I plus B sub I, et cetera, okay? Can you go a slide back for a second? Yeah. You got a question? Okay. Uh, because the, the operator class is overloaded for your vectors and produces the expression Yes. Um, note the etc. So operator stars. <laughs> operator. I mean, you're right. The operator plus is defined, but I also defined operator star. I just didn't list it here. Yeah. Okay. So then we've got, um, you know, element wise again for every a sub i, we add to it. Uh, B sub i if D sub i is less than 30, otherwise we add to it C sub i, okay? Because we're using that yap if else thing that looks like the ternary, or works like the ternary operator. But um, of course, this is all for every element uh, instead of one at a time. 
And, and so you get the idea. I won't, I won't go into such a deep breakdown of all the rest of them, but um, it is interesting to note that assign E comma C works even though those are different types because you know we're just under the covers for each um, assignment, we're just assigning an int into a double and that you know works just fine. Okay, so you've seen a lot of these macros already. Um, it's not necessary to understand these su super deeply, but I want people to have a sense of what macros there are because um, they, I think, cover all the cases you really care about. I, I, if there's any missing, please let me know. Um, so they all take an expression template that tells it what kind of what kind of expression template to use to make the expression that that they make, <coughs> and uh, so this one is just like the binary operator member we've seen, but just for unary operations like tilde and uh, unary minus. This is the binary operator member that we've seen many times already, um, and uh, <coughs> this only matches on the left again because it's a member, uh, and it matches anything on the right. And um, so, for example, if uh, I do, um, I've got a, a YAP terminal here that I'm making into expr. Expr divided by expr is fine because, again, there's an expression on the left. Expr divided by zero is also fine because there's an expression on the left. But the next one is not fine because there's an expression on the right. And there's just no such operator, right? If I do the uh, member call operator, that defines the call operator on your expression template. And Oh, and I should have mentioned that these are defined three times, once for each uh, of the uh, L value, R value, and const L value ref quals that you could put on the end of the member function. So all those bases are covered, and it, it essentially means that you get um, the, the right semantics when you're using these in expressions with move and stuff like that. Uh, that's all handled for you. Um, and the call, the call operator is uh, one I'm not super happy with because there's no way to constrain it to a certain number of uh, arguments. Uh, maybe I could find a way to do that, but um, I, I haven't I haven't done that so far. So it's it's just a generic call operator that's that's very attic. You can add any number of arguments or call it with any number of arguments. Uh, so the free binary operator uh, has two uh, uh, templates that it defines. One that matches L values on the right. One that, values, that matches R values on the right. The uh, right side has to be an expression, and the left side cannot be an expression. Uh, so that, that's what makes it the complement of the, the member ones. And so um, if we do expert divided by expert, that doesn't work because of an expression on the left. Expert divided by zero doesn't work for the same reason, but the other two ju uh, work just fine. Whether it's an R value or L value makes no difference. Okay, so the if else, um, like pseudo ternary operator, uh, there's also a macro for that. There's a macro for when you've got um, your UDT, which you specify which UDTs you match by providing a type trait uh, and anything else in the if else. Uh, there's one for uh, UDT matching unary operators for a free unary operator. Uh, there's one where you've got uh, uh, two different type traits on either side, right? And this is really useful for uh, making like affine spaces. So if you want to have uh, uh, matrix divided by double work, but not double divided by matrix. You might want to use this to define your operator, uh, you know, operator divide. And uh, what is the difference between these two? Oh, this is the same thing, except it just needs uh, the, it can match the trade on either side. Okay, and uh, we can uh, also get the placeholder operator, um, uh, the, yeah, the literal placeholder operator, the literal operator for placeholders um, by using this macro, and that tells it which uh, expression template to, to use. And then um, there is this other macro that is uh, kind of odd. So this only applies to YAP expression. It was sort of an experiment to see if I could make these expressions really natural. So if you remember back a few slides, we saw double D1 equals and then some YAP expression, but we didn't define how we get from that YAP expression to assigning to a double. And how we got there was this. So for that example, I defined this macro and I was using YAP expression. And so what this gives us is a templated conversion operator. So we basically say, this expression template is convertible to anything. If you put something on the right-hand side, or sorry, left-hand side and try to, try to assign it to that thing, sure, we'll try it. And you might get a compilation error or it might work depending on the specifics of the case, right? Um, what I really wanted to do was to constrain um, R to be whatever you can evaluate this expression as, but you can't do that uh, with uh, enable if and, and Svine kind of tricks. 
Uh, hopefully you can do that with, um, with concepts. I have reason to believe you can, but uh, it's, I've been unable to try it out so far. Um, but you might want to apply a similar pattern um, if you make a, a YAP expression template uh, that just you know, has a specific type that you want to convert it to and maybe enumerate several of these. Uh, and, and if you want to do anything more than just having specific types in there, then obviously you, you do need some kind of constraint on R. Okay, so I am not a proto expert. There's probably at least one person here that's more of a proto expert than me. Um, but we will do a, a kind of high-level comparison. So uh, proto has to do everything implicitly because when you have a proto expression, when you get to the semicolon, you're done. Right? You can't capture it in an auto and then do a bunch of stuff to it later because it's written against the 98 standard. When you get to the semicolon, you have to do all your work. So you have to, tell, you have to plan out what that work's going to be before you ever uh, write that expression in your code. Right? It has to know what all the transforms are going to be. It needs to know uh, when to apply the transforms, how to apply the transforms. All that has to be known from looking at the content of that expression. And all that stuff has to be conveyed in there somehow. And so Proto has some somewhat complicated mechanisms for making this work um, because all that information has to be captured before you write the expression. So, you can do the same thing with YAP by using those implicit techniques like I was talking about earlier, uh, but you don't have to. And in fact, I discourage you from doing so. I think it's, it's, not, it's not a good way to write code. Uh, and we'll see some comparisons in a bit. So uh, Pro, uh, Proto uses these uh, contexts to give meaning to those expressions. So when you, you know, before you write the expression, you have to uh, figure out like how to evaluate that expression. And there's different contexts that you can give to Proto that, that tell it how to do that evaluation under those different contexts. What I would prefer you to do with YAP is just, you know, your, the, the context is your, is, your, uh, is your code, right? Write a transform or use local stuff in, in the surrounding code to, to figure out what the, the actual evaluation context should look like. Uh, and so there's a bunch of expression evaluation stuff uh, that, that happens in Proto that, frankly, I don't quite understand that are, Partly because they're so damn complicated. <laughs> so I, I've, I've repeatedly tried to understand them, and I, I, I can't get it. So, all right. <clears throat> so uh, Proto has long compile times because it's written against the 98 standard, and YAP does not. Um, there's a stress test where I do, I forget the number, unfortunately, but it's, it's, it's on the order of hundreds or thousands of, of terminals, and it compiles in like a couple seconds or a few seconds or something. It's, it's, it's very nice. Uh, Proto is not going to do that. <clears throat> All right, you get it. Okay, so some lessons learned. Like I said, I started out doing this uh, entirely as a C++ 17 project and then sort of backported things to C++ 14. So that, that's kind of where a lot of these, these things came from. Uh, the first such thing is that I used a static const for the expert kind to tell you what kind of expression you've got instead of like a tag type, okay? And I did that because you get to write this in C++ 17. You get to say like, is it an XBRF? Cool, we'll do that. Is it a terminal? Cool, we'll do that. And you just write auto on the front of the function and the rest is magic. The compiler just figures it out for you. It's great. Because one of these and only one of these will be instantiated. The auto is deterministic. There's not, you know, there's nothing for the compiler to, to do. There's no heavy lifting. This compiles fast even. It's, it's great. Um, <clears throat> the alternative when you do it in uh, 14, which I backported, uh, did as part of the backporting effort, is that you have to you know, have a specialization for each one of these guys, and, and it's a lot of code to write. This looks like switch context would be helpful. Switch context per would be my friend, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, if you write complex template code in 14, do it in 17 first. I'm not kidding, and it will save you time. And the reason it will save you time <laughs> is this is the implementation of value, which you saw earlier. What value does in broad strokes is if you pass it a non-expression, it just forwards it through. If you pass it a binary expression or any arity greater than one, it just passes it through. <laughs> if it's a unary expression, there's a special case for expref where it dereferences it first. Otherwise, it returns it, uh, it either uh, moves it out or gives you a reference to it depending on you know, the, the, uh, the properties of the thing you're, you're trying to get the value of. And um, that's what this does. And you know, I, I, I was trying to explain to some coworkers like why if constexpr is so important and they were like, I don't get it. And I was like, look at this, what does this do? And they were like, what does constexpr mean here? And I said, what you put in the parens has to be something you can evaluate at compile time. They're like, oh, I get it. Then I showed them this. <laughs> that is the same thing, right? And 
I'm not going to step through all that. What this does, it does because I made some mistakes along the way. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So you can kind of replicate the recursive logic in Fortune as well. There is an implementation in Hana, and I made my own LSTP one, where you can say, like, static git, some constant expression, then you provide a generic lambda, which yeah. gets instantiated only if the recursive expression is true. It's not as nice, there's a lot of boilerplate. But it's self-contained, and you can read it top to bottom. Okay, so the comment was, nah. -uh. All right, so <laughs> we're gonna. So according to Vittorio, you can do this. You can do this in in C plus plus fourteen as well. I don't know about that. I have not done that, but I, I hazard a guess that it's not that little code. So either either way, either way, I'd still want to do this this way first. And so the thing is that I made lots of mistakes with this function, right? Different times I was like, ah, value gets used in more context than I wanted to, and it works differently in different places, and none of these, these nice things are working. And I had to keep coming back to this and making changes to it. And there was maybe, you know, five or six different versions of this. And um, so the point is that making those five or six changes here was trivial. Making the five or six changes here would have maybe pull out what's remaining of my hair, right? That's no good. So trying to explain why a particular um, uh, instantiation is, is the better one uh, in, in trying to figure out uh, you know, partial, partial template specializations here, because there's some, is, is nearly impossible for, for most people I've worked with, right? Um, explaining this to them is trivial. So if nothing else, I would like to write my code in 17 like this, port it to 14 or 11 or whatever I'm doing, and then I can write a test that says, that exercises all of this, and then the other stuff, I can make sure that, that I, I didn't make a mistake by running the, the new code, which is way more verbose against that, even if you use these interesting techniques like maybe Vittorio and, and Louis have, have done. Okay, so lesson three. Customization points are not the greatest solution. And uh, the reason for that is that <clears throat> uh, eval plus, as an example, is one of the customization points. If you want to have two different eval pluses that get picked up somewhere in your code, you have to have two different types you're using the stuff with, entirely two different types, or you have to have them in different namespaces or something along those lines, right? It's very difficult to say like, well, in this case I want to do this, in this case I want to do that. And I think you know Proto does this with uh, you know those those complicated abstractions that I was talking about before, like um, you know context and whatever the other ones were. I, don't, I can never keep them straight. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the, the takeaway here is that um, doing it the explicit way, I think, makes your life easier than the implicit way because ADL is the mechanism uh, that we're, we're using to do the implicit stuff. And I think the implicit, explicit transforms rather just make better code. So um, let's say we've got a YAP expression template, my expert, and it does a bunch of, of work with um, you know, numeric stuff, some of which might include matrices. If I want to assign one to a matrix, then this operator equals, and you know, this could have been pulled out somewhere else, but the point is you want to have one function somewhere that reifies that expression into the actual type that you are assigning it to. And that one place can have, oh, I'm doing this transform, and then I'm doing that one, and then I'm doing that one, and so on. And if you need to make choices here, like do I want to do this transform, do I not want to do it, do I want to parameterize the transforms differently, you can have a one-stop shop for people to see what's happening in the expression template logic, the real guts, the important part of what the expression template does. And the reason this is so important is um, you should go and write some boost uBlast code, just like AX plus B equals Y, okay? Just write that. Um, and then go and try to figure out which transformations hit. Um, and if you can do that, I'll give you a thousand dollars. No, I'm not, <laughs> but because I, it's very hard to do, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I used uBlast for many years for many things, and I was always trying to figure out what exactly my code was getting transformed into, and I, you know, it's very difficult. And, and Eigen, I think, is arguably even more difficult to, to do that with. Okay. So, oh yeah, back here, uh, this last little assignment here, if we made this a temporary, uh, uh, sorry, if we, if we made this uh, a terminal, maybe we could have had a, yet another optimization here, depending on what's in uh, X per N. So, but, but you get the idea, right? Okay, so I think that is it. Do you have any more questions?
Victoria. Maybe it's crazy. Could you use this to, as an implementation building block for ranges? Could you use this as an implementation building block for ranges? So one thing I did not cover, so I'm glad you asked this, is that everything I've showed you so far has been more or less mathematically oriented stuff because that's the thing where expression templates typically get used these days. Um, those are the domains people reach for them in most often. But if you had a whole bunch of function calls and um, you nested them in a certain way and you could tell from the shape of those, those related function calls that you could elide some of them or you could move this in, because you know you could capture it over here or those kinds of things, then you could rewrite those function calls to be a better set of function calls. And so something like um, a, a bunch of, you know, crazy complicated range nested calls or, or chained together range calls or something like that. I think it's absolutely the kind of use case this would be good for, yeah. Yeah. Um, just a comment regarding Proto and the C colon problem. Um, you can capture Proto expressions with auto. Uh, you can customize it so that it actually copies all the stuff in. Right, so, so the comment was that, that Proto has an auto um, that you can you can write so you can do a, a basically a proto auto equals some expression and you can customize whether it does a copy or a move, um, and th that is true. Sorry, a copy or a reference is what I should have yeah. said. I think yeah. Um, so and and that is true. But the the point I was trying to make before was that proto that was a, an adjunct thing that was added to proto later. Uh, initially, proto was written against the ninety eight standard, and because there was no way to do that, like that informed the structure of all of proto. So you still have that phenomenon where at the semicolon at the end of your expression, you have to be able to, to do that. And so the structure of everything in Proto is that it's, it's all done implicitly. So anyone else? No? All right. Well, if you're interested in checking it out, it's up on GitHub. Uh, and I'm planning to submit it for boost review sometime in the near future. And I have a, a, a review manager, which is the, uh, the hard part a lot of times for getting something into the review, review queue. So um, check it out if you're interested. Thanks.